Hallelujah, Jesus, yes. Love it, love it, Jesus, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless you, Lord. Jesus, thank you. Mm. All right. Word of God says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain who build it. I love that scripture. And I believe this morning, as, you, as you're finding your seats again, I believe this morning that this house is a house that's being built by the Lord. I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse of where we was and where we were going. From day one, when God called Shelly and I to Martinsville, we, we decided to, to say yes with that calling. And in that calling, we started in a little park and from that park, we had four curtains and a, and a guitar stool and a mic and two little bitty speakers and, a, and a, a couple of lights. And then we went from there to the youth center. Then we went from the youth center, setting up, tearing down for several months, several months, eight, nine months. And it was a big, big thing because I don't do things little, man. It was just a big thing. And God continued to move. He continued to grow and he brought us to this place. And I'm so grateful. He brought us here during COVID and I thought, Lord, what are you doing right in the middle of COVID? I'm like, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? And God blessed us and kept blessing us and kept blessing us and kept opening the doors and making way for people to come and worship him and glorify him even through that pandemic that we went through. And I want you to know from, from point A to where we are now, it's been an uphill all the way. There's not been any leveling off or not been any going back down and coming back up. It's literally been up all the way. Why? Because Shelly and I as your leaders have invested everything in him. We have sold out to Jesus. We have made him Lord of our lives. In everything, in everything, we have made him Lord in our lives. And so I want you to know when you get behind us, Listen, it's not about a number of people. It's about a people who are sold out, building an army for Jesus that's going to make a difference. Not an army of numbers, but an army for Jesus that's going to make a difference. And I believe that you are the army that he's chose for this time, for such a time as this. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20. I love it because my brother Steve knows every time I give a scripture, he knows exactly what it's going to say, but he don't know what I'm going to say. And I love that because he mentors me, he talks with me, we meet, and he tells me things and shares stories and some things he'll say, and I say, no, I'm not going to do that, and I'll do this. And, and, uh, but for the most part, I listen to what he says and what, he, what, he, what advice he gives me. Thank you, Steve, for all your advice. And... Um, but because he's watched me grow from day one, he does not know what I'm going to say when, <laughs> when I quote a scripture verse or give a scripture verse out. But today we're going to be talking about lordship, who's lord of your life. And in this passage, it says, Matthew 7, 20, it says, wherefore by their fruits, you shall know them. We should know everyone by their fruits. When someone comes to Christ, their fruit should start blooming, blossoming, and continue to grow. Not die, get dead, and wither, and dry up, and fall away. That's their sin. Their sin nature, their sin attributes will die up and fall away. You should know them by their fruits. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus talking. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. How many people do you say, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, the Lord said this, or he told me this, or told me that? And he's saying not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is his words. But he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. 
So the only way to make it to heaven is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and life, and no man could come to the Father but through me. And by what he's saying right here is by if we do the will of the Father, then he will say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But if we do not do the will of the Father, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in thy name? And haven't we cast out devils in thy name and done many wonderful works in thy name that he says I will profess to them I never knew you depart from me you worker of iniquity I'm not going to hear those words why because I'm sold out he is my Lord and my Savior I am not going to hear those words depart from me you worker of iniquity I will not allow myself to hear those things but some people are going to hear those words as glorious and great as you think that God is that he's just everybody's love and he's bringing them all in he's telling us right here there's going to be some that prophesied how much we lift prophets up on high some that prophesied ones who cast out demons and do many wonderful things He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Lordship in our life is everything. We must have lordship in our life. We must let him be lord of our life. And that word we hear often in the Christian church, Christ is often referred to as the Lord Jesus or our Lord Christ. Disciples were baptized in the name of the Lord. Encouraged to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. They spoke boldly in the name of the Lord and gave thanks in the name of the Lord. It's important to know the significance of the title Lord. What does that mean to you? When you think of Lord, what does that mean to you? Because we hear the phrase all the time. I really wish that we would stop saying the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, unless we know for sure that he really did. We've gotten as a church in a habit of saying, well, God said this and God said that, and the Lord told me this, and the Lord told me that. I don't think so, so much. Because listen, if, if, you, if Jesus was Lord of your life like some of you say he is, your life would look a little bit different than what it does. I'm just saying. I'm on the outside looking in. I'm on the outside watching not saying that we're not growing in Christ. Not saying that we're not growing in our walk with Christ. Because, because this weekend, um, I, I prayed for a guy in the store. And Shelly um, was looking for me. We're shopping for some stuff for the canoe trip. And uh, I saw this guy once. And he had this tattoo right here. And his name was Nick. And I, and, and, um, and I saw him. And he walked through the store. And I heard the Lord say, go minister to him. And uh, he got out of my sight. And I'm like, well, Lord, if he comes back around again, I know it was you. Boom, he steps right back in front of me again. So I started talking to him. He just got out of prison a year ago. Had a bottle of vodka in his, in his cart. That didn't move me at all. It doesn't move Jesus. Just because he had the bottle of vodka there doesn't mean he's not wanting to live for God. He just hasn't got that far yet. But there's going to be fruit, and I've seen fruit in his life already. I've seen it in his eyes. I've seen it in his character. I've seen it in how he carried himself. Even with everything that someone who is not discerning would, would place him as or would label upon him, I did not because I knew that he really wanted a relationship with Jesus. He wanted to walk deeper. That, that didn't move me, and it didn't move God because God knows this man's life. So I'm grateful this morning that we can have discernment and we can know if someone is truly seeking after God or if they're playing games. For some reason, I've gotten the ability to know if you're playing games or not with God. He just shows me those things. I don't know why. I don't know how I know it. I just know. And when it says you'll know a person by their fruits, you will know a person by their fruits. We need to be so discerning in the spirit that when, a, when, when an enemy walks in our camp, we need to know that the enemy is in our camp. Not look it over. Not look 
well, they're, they're bringing all this stuff and they're doing all these things. They have all these instruments and all that. No, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters because those who prophesy, he will say, depart from me. Those who did wonderful things, he will say, depart from me. I mean, this is a strong scripture. I know Steve wants me to make everybody laugh every now and then. So you guys can laugh right now if you want. But listen, this is a strong scripture. This is truth. This is the word of God, what he's saying. We need to be a people who make him Lord. So in that lordship, he can give us everything that he has for us. So in that lordship, we can be discerning and know when the enemy is in our camp. And we can pray over those things. Do we have ambient music? I feel like it's so quiet up here. I need some background to fill some stuff in so I can think. Sometimes he's just showing me stuff and downloading things. Man, I don't want to just spit everything out. Jesus, thank you. So it's significant to know the title Lord, what Lord means in your life. When you say Lord Jesus Christ, you're not hearing the first, middle, and last name of God. You're actually hearing the three aspects of who God was and who God is today. That's what you're hearing when you say Lord Jesus Christ, who he was and who he is. Jesus is the name of God manifest in the flesh, in the flesh. Under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's that name that was given to him when he became flesh. That name that we claim that we must be saved under. Jesus. The name of Jesus. Thank you. Christ is the title which describes the function on earth. The Messiah. The anointed one. He was anointed for the purpose of saving his people, of saving us from our sins. Plays the role of the Son of God. So when we speak that word, Lord, this shouldn't just be a word that we say or a name that we say it should be an ongoing role in our life that he plays not just some days or Sundays or Wednesdays but Lord as a role through our whole walk day in day out from the time we wake up from the time we go to bed Lord I give you this day Lord I thank you for this day The definition of Lord is one having authority over another, a master. Does Jesus have authority over your life as master? I'm not condemning you if he don't. I'm telling you he needs to be. If he's not, he needs to be. As I said, I'm not going to be standing before him and him say, depart from me and I don't want you to be in that position either I don't I want all of us to make and hear those words well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord the last words Peter wrote to the church in 2nd Peter 318 he says but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Savior saved us from our sin. Lord is the one that we follow and, we, and he's lead of every part of our life. Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is to have the saving power and supreme authority over our lives. He is to be our master. I love it. I love having a, a master, someone to guide me and lead me. You know, when I, was, when I was young, I had, you know, the four dads by the time I was 16. So when I grew up, I thought, man, I need someone to lead me. I didn't have anybody that led me. I didn't have anyone. I wanted that. You know, kids want that. Children, your children want someone to tell them no. 
They want them to say, this is how it's supposed to be done. To lead them and guide them. They long for that. They long for that. I long for that. So I tried to get in the military. And I already had three kids by the time I was 22 years old. So they wouldn't let me in the military. I had too many kids. But I wanted that because I wanted someone to tell me how to get my life lined out. To get my life lined up. Because I didn't know Jesus then. I did. I met him when I was eight. But I didn't know him like I know him now. As my leader. As my Lord. As my Savior. I didn't know him in those ways. So I am so thankful that he is my master. And Chuck Colson says this. The greatest challenging, challenge facing the church today is... is to reinsert lordship in Christ. For us to reinsert that lordship in Christ. Because the sad state of the church in America today is a number of people who love God on Sunday and relatively ignore him and his word on Monday through Saturday. We love God on Sunday. When he tells us something to do Monday through Saturday, we just ignore those things, those words that he speaks to us, even, even if, if and when we maybe read the scripture. Jesus has become a hobby to many people. How many of you have a hobby? Relate that to some people really have Jesus as their hobby. They pick him up every now and then, put him back down. Pick him up when they need him, when they need comforted, and they need something, or something's going wrong in their life. They pick him up, and they put him back down because they have something else they want to do. We cannot have Jesus in that place in our life. Some think of him as a good friend, and you can think of him occasionally. The church has become a thing to do for some people. Oh, it's a thing to do. Hey, it's Sunday. Why don't we go to church? Why don't we just ask Sunday? Let's go to church and see what's going on there. See what those people are doing in that house. What I'm doing is glorifying him, worshiping him, magnifying him, lifting him up, bringing everything to him that he's worthy of. I'm not bringing my problems, my struggles, my battles. I'm not bringing none of that stuff here. I give him those things during the week. Sunday I come and I lift him up. I make him most in my life. In far too many cases, because of our busy, hectic schedule, we, we, we got all this stuff going on, and then we put Jesus right here. And we got all this stuff right before him. You might do that. It's not too late to shift that and bring him from here to top. It's never too late to change that, that hectic schedule can I tell you, if you put Jesus at the top of that hectic schedule, that schedule is going to go smooth. I tell you, it does. If and when a day comes, and it has a few times that I've not had the time to spend my morning time, my precious morning time with him, I feel it during the day. My day just seems to go, wow, all out of whack. I'm stressed, I'm frustrated, you know, I, things move me that normally don't move me, I, I, I'm, 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 I, I get tired easier, I don't get nothing hardly accomplished. But when I go, and I, I've told you this before, when I go and I put him here and my prayer time is in the morning, and I give him a few hours in the morning just to soak with him and love on him and, and praise him, man, my day just goes smooth, man, I get so much done in a day, it just blows my mind how much stuff I get done. It blows my mind, but it's because I've put him in the right order in my day. First, not second, third, fourth, fifth. I put him first in my day, always. Except for those few times that I missed and I, <laughs> something seemed to be more pressing. But he's teaching me about all those things. He's, and, and that's okay because in that I learned the lesson. If I would have never not put him first at one time, I wouldn't have learned that lesson of how important it is to have him first in my life because being first in my life makes everything go so much better. So much better. 
I don't want him to fall second place to you or down the line in your lives. I don't want him to be Some of us treat him as just like a casual acquaintance. Maybe the church's fault for that. Maybe the preacher's fault for that. That we just make it just casual. Just a casual thing to love Jesus every now and then. Or I, I don't know. I don't know why we make it a casual thing. We casually read scripture because in reality, the scripture is clear. It's clear that the creator of this world and the God of our forefathers shed his blood to redeem us has no intention of being a God in our life. He has no intention whatsoever of being a God in our lives. He expects to be the God, the Lord, the master of our lives. Scripture doesn't make it lightly that Jesus is just this lightly thing. No, it declares that he is to be all of the above. He is to be our Lord, our Savior, our everything. Many Christians today create in their mind an image of God that is an end result of their own ideas and own desires. He's a God who's okay. Listen, some people think this, that he's a God that is okay with, with being an afterthought. I don't like being an afterthought, do you? I mean, my wife... She loves our kids, and sometimes I feel like I'm an afterthought. <laughs> I'm like, hey, why are you in my, one of my baby moods, maybe? You know how guys get those moods that, you know, they want all the attention? In some of those moods, I'm like, man, I don't want to be an afterthought. I want, you, I want to be your first thought when you wake up in the morning. This after God. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Sometimes, man, I feel like I'm on her pole. I'm like, clear down here. I'm like, man, I don't want to be that way. I want to be your, I want to be your first thought. I want that first kiss in the morning. I love you, Shelly. I do. <laughs> you want to tag team on that one right now? <laughs> we could tag team on that one. That would be fun. <laughs> He doesn't want to be an afterthought. We, we sometimes think that God, he understands we have things that are more important than he is. And he's all, all right, I know that this is more important that, that you go and do this on the weekend and you don't come to, to my house. Or, you know, prayers on Wednesday and they're all meeting there. But it's okay because you've got all this stuff you've got to do. And I understand that's more important than I am. He don't think that way. He does not think that that's more important at all. But we, we have this mindset that we think because of the casualness that we have that, that it's okay. There's still an authority there that we have to align with. Even though he is our friend, even though that he is my best friend, I still hold him in authority. You know, Darlene and I, are, we're great best friends but she also knows that I'm pastor and that she has to take that friendship at times and go, wow, my pastor, I got to take him. I can't just be a friend. I have to, there's, when he says something or this happens, that, that now it's a different role. And that's the way we have to have God. He's here. He wants to love on us and be with us and hang with us and play and have all that fun and be that friend. But also he wants to be Lord and master of our life as well as being the friend of our life. Yeah. You guys good with this? The result of much of mainstream Christianity has um, erected an idol for themselves, a false god. 
They come into worship once or twice a week. They call him Jesus. Mainstream. Has erected an idol that they worship and they call him Jesus. But he does not resemble, listen, he does not resemble the Lord of the New Testament. Nor do they treat him as he is commanded. Perhaps they think of him about Think of him occasionally. That he is the God of the Old Testament and was manifested in flesh to die for our sins in the New Testament. But that's all they think of him as. The God of the Old Testament who came in the flesh and died to save us from our sins. They don't look at him as Lord that he should be looked at. Jesus Christ came declaring and affirming that he should be first in our lives. And the greatest commandment was asked by Matthew. He said, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy heart soul and with all thy mind. God is not really interested in the leftovers that we have for him or the afterthoughts that we have for him. And he's not impressed. Listen, he is not impressed by our casual approach to him. Colossians 1.17 says this. He is before all things and by him all things Consist, And he is the head of the body and the church who is the beginning of the firstborn of the dead. That in all things, listen, in all things, he might have supremacy. That supreme place in your life that he might have supremacy. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is supreme. He takes precedence over all things in your life. He doesn't consider himself um, just a God to come and look at on Sundays. He doesn't consider himself that way. He's not humbled when you choose to come to church on Wednesday. He considers you and I, listen, he considers you and I fortunate to come to him in his presence. Not the other way around. You and I are fortunate to be in the presence of God in a house that is created in open heaven because of leaders saying yes to him. You are fortunate to be able to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. To be able to be in the presence of a Lord and Savior who wants you to come into that relationship and fellowship with him. Guys, listen, religion is growing at such a rapid rate in our, in our world today. The desire for religious or desire for religion is growing in, in such a rapid, rapid rate. Yet so is immoral behavior. It's growing at that same rapid rate. It's starting to blend together. It's all starting to blend together. It's what the enemy wants. The result is that there's little difference between those who go to church and those who don't. There's a little difference. There is a difference, but there's a little difference. And to know the difference, you have to be on fire for Jesus. Know exactly what he wants out of your life because the difference is, is that when you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, listen, when you know him as your Lord and Savior, you're going to be able to discern everyone, whether they're living for God or not, because you're going to feel that kindred spirit upon them that is in you. You're going to know that. Not by their faults and their failures and everything they're doing wrong, but just by the spirit that lives in them. You're going to know that they are someone seeking after the things of God, after the love of God, after the ambitions of God, after everything God has for them.
care. Many churches have become content with teaching and preaching and leaving the impression that God is okay simply being the God of a Sunday people. He has no problem. Yeah. That he has no problem with the church living according to the values of the world. How many of you are living according to the values of the world? The dress of the world, the priorities of, the, of your time are, are fashioned around the world. Your finances are fashioned around the things of the world. There's a decline in true Christianity today in our nation. And the issue is a lack of lordship. Lack of him being lord in your life. That's what the decline is. Too many people say Jesus is this and Jesus is that, but he's not Lord. His name is going to be powerful because his name is powerful. You're going to be able to prophesy in the name of Jesus because of the name of Jesus. Because of the gifts that he gives you, they're irrefutable. You're going to be able to do these things. But when it lacks lordship, it lacks everything that he has for you. There's some statistics out there that say that all Christians in America, this is in America, all Christians in America, hope you don't fit in these categories. 20% of Christians in America never attend church. Or the ones who say they're Christians never attend church. 20% of them. 25% of them never pray. 30% never read their Bible. 40% never give to the church. 75% never assume any kind of a position in a church or any kind of a ministry from the church or outside the church. 85% never attend a midweek service. 95% have never won a person to Christ. That's our main job. So winning lost souls. I can't, I can't, I can't even count how many that I've, that I've won, that I've prayed over. I mean, I, I, it's daily. I don't, I don't even understand not doing it. I don't even understand not bringing people to Christ on a daily basis. It's not even in my vocabulary. It's not even in my, my, my agenda. Yet 100% these people think that they're going to heaven. Refer back to, Lord, Lord, haven't we did this? Haven't we did this? And he says, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. I never was intimate with you. I never had that relationship with you. Never. Let me share this with you. This past week, last week, I was trying to find some of those for our, our communion, some of them goblet things, them goblet, they, they call them goblets. And I was, I went through every, every line in this store in the city, Trader Baker, I went through every, every aisle. And as I was going through the aisle looking for this thing, I started seeing some other things. I thought, man, that's cool. I think I'm going to get that. That's cool. Oh, wow, I like that. that. That would look good in my office. And I just kept going through. I was grabbing stuff, you know, just nickel and dime stuff, but I'm still grabbing it. And I'm, and I'm going through and, and uh, all the way through, and I'm praying and loving Jesus, you know, and I was, you know, looking for someone to minister to. I think I did grab a couple people and talk to them about Jesus, and I'm, you know, just going through. And, and I got to the very end of the aisle, and I did not find no goblets, but what I did find that, that the Lord said, put it all back. He did put it all back. I'm like, wait a minute. All of it? All of it. And it was so stern that it was like when you were a kid and your, your mom or dad called your first, middle, and last name. You knew something was getting ready to go down. And that's what happened. He called my first, but Jason Lewis Abney put it all back. <laughs> Now, if he wasn't Lord of my life, I wouldn't have put it back and I would have gotten that big whipping. But because he's Lord of my life, 
I scurried back to every booth and I put everything back where it was. I mean, I was just taking it back, like right where I picked it up at. I was reading the numbers on the labels of where I got it. Some of it was cleared at the very beginning. I ran through that store twice, but I put the stuff back. That's when you know that he's Lord of your life. In the smallest things, you hear him and listen to what he's saying. It doesn't matter how big or small you think it is. If he says no, then it's no. If he says go, then it's go. If he says yes, you better listen and do what he says to do. We have to. Why don't we read our word like we're supposed to? Why don't we meditate on him like we're supposed to? Or pray regularly? Or why don't we put him first in our finances like we're supposed to? Or work in a ministry like he's called us to? And why don't we share the gospel everywhere we go? Why are we afraid to do those things? Don't be afraid to go out and mess it up and someone close the door on you or someone cuss you out. You've been cussed out before. So what? Don't let those things move you. Let God move you into those areas. He's got so many opportunities for every one of us. That he wants us to, I mean, he want, today he wants you to go out and grab a hold of someone and tell them. Don't just go, don't just go, hey, um, I go to church and this and this. Man, make it intimate. Say, listen, who, who are you? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I ask him, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Not just the name. Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? You didn't just say words. Did you literally say, God, I believe that you are the Son of God, and I'm asking you to forgive me my sins and come into my heart and live in my life. I know that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Ask him like that. Because they're going to say yes or no or get away from me. It doesn't matter. What matters is the obedience that you have to God. When he says... Jimmy, for you, and I know you minister to a lot of people, when he says to you, Jimmy, go over and talk to this person, when you say no and you step before God, because I know you will, when you step before God, he's going to say, why did you not go talk to that person? How many why did you not are we going to hear from God? I don't want to hear those, why did you not do that? Man, why did you not do that? Why did you not do that? Because I do believe that there's going to be people miss out because we do not step up. I really believe that there will be people that miss out from what the Lord showed me because we're not stepping up. So who are you willing to miss out for? Are you afraid to be embarrassed because someone's might be standing around? Listen, when I'm praying for someone in the store, I don't care who's standing around. I don't care. I'll tell them, listen, we can pray right here. I can talk to you. You can keep your eyes open, close them, whatever you want to do. I'm going to pray with my eyes open because I'm going to watch and see what happens. The Word of God says that. Watch and see. Pray. Watch and see what happens. I'm going to do that every time. And they always close their eyes. As we've been taught. Just close your eyes. So we don't get distracted by the things of the world. Man, I keep my eyes wide open because I want to, I want to watch what God's going to do. I want to watch how their facial expression changes. How God moves in their heart. Moves in their life. My friend Ted says this all the time. Either he is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. It's a good word, Ted. Lord of all or not Lord at all. It's not my opinion. It's not Ted's opinion. It's not our interpretation of it. It's God's declaration that he should be Lord of everything. Everything. What does everything mean? <laughs> Look it up. Look it up in your dictionary. It means everything. Everything. Everything you own. Your house. John Wesley's house burnt down. They come and told him, hey, your house burnt down. He goes, not my house. It's the Lord's house. One more thing I don't have to deal with. And you might think that's haughty, but no, that's truth. God's been dealing with me so much on things in my life. Man, I, I am I'm sick. I'm literally sick. I want to start shedding things off so fast. Like, I, 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 I literally want to go to my storage. I got a storage unit because I'm remodeling my house. But I'm like, I haven't used this stuff for a year and a half, almost two years. I don't need any of it. Like, at all. 
I literally want to get rid of everything that I have in storage and be done with it. Matter of fact, I really want to sell my house and just go, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just literally want to just be done with everything and just give him, give him it all. I literally want to give him it all. I'm going to make a challenge here in a couple of weeks. We're going to make a challenge because we're, we're, I'm going to talk to you about some things the Lord's transitions he's made. And I've got a motorcycle, a 1970 Honda motorcycle. It's a vintage bike. I got it for my 50th birthday. Thank you, Shelly, for that bike for my 50th birthday. But I heard the Lord say that he wants me to sell it and give the money to the church. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to make a proposition to you in a few weeks after this little series that he has us on, Lordship. I know it's deep and it's tight, but it's going to take you deeper if you listen. It really will take you deeper, making him Lord. So in the meantime, find something in your life that's so valuable to you that you're willing to part with it for him, for the kingdom. It's all about kingdom work, storing up treasures in heaven, not here on earth, in heaven, in heaven, where it matters most, where it matters most. Let's stand. I am not even close to being done with this, but I know you guys are. I could build it in the atmosphere. Guys, we're living in perilous times. Opposition will only grow greater. It's only going to get worse. Things are only going to get, opposition is only going to grow greater. I think things are not really worse because God is just showing off even more and more. It looks, the appearance of everything is going downhill, but it's really not. It's really not. He knows what's going on. He's not, he not moved by any of it. But false doctrines, false views, what it means to be a Christian. We've already seen that will become a norm. To sin and live in sin will become a norm. To live in sin, but yet calling upon the name of Jesus. And be okay with that. They're going to be shaken when they stand before God. When they think that they're going to make heaven. It's a sad day. So many things fighting for position of the throne of your heart. It's innumerable. We need to center up on Jesus. Let him be Lord of our life. Let him reign in our life. But you know this morning, God has given each one of us a certain amount of time, of resources, of gifts, of opportunities. And whether or not we use them for his glory and purpose determines whether or not we will experience his favor. If you want the fullness that God has for your life, he has to be Lord. If he's not Lord, you will never get the fullness that he has for you. There's so much that he wants for you, so much that he wants for you, desires for you. But if he is not Lord of your life, you will never have the fullness that you think you have in all the things you have. It won't. I could read you quotes from millionaires millionaire never smiles they're not happy they've committed suicide money will not make you happy giving your money will make you happy it makes me joy I love it man I love I love giving it's my favorite thing to give 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 I love it I would give till I was broke if I could but that would be not very smart either <laughs> But you can't outgive God. You really can't outgive Him. We got a few more weeks. We're going to carry on with this. Don't not come next week just because. <laughs> Listen, don't not come. This is something new that God put in my heart even this morning. And um, so, remember, I'm an ex bounty hunter. 
No, no. I, I said remember that because of my preaching. Remember, I'm an ex-bounty hunter, so give me a little bit of slack. You know, I come straight out of that, full-blown into pastoring. So I'm learning as I'm going as well as you're learning as you're going. So just remember that. And I went from taking them down and making them talk to me about Jesus, but it's different. It is a different, it's a different thing being a pastor than it is being a bounty hunter. Because I would say to them, do you want to talk about Jesus or go to jail? They're like, let's talk about Jesus. <laughs> In hopes that I might let them go. <laughs> and I've wanted to so many times. Believe me, I have wanted to let them go so many times. I mean, my heart broke for them. I wanted to go pay their bond and let them go. But I didn't. And when you come to the church, <laughs> You want to talk about Jesus? Well, I got some other stuff I got going on right now, so I don't think I'll make it today. <laughs> Let's make Jesus Lord of our life. Let's put him top in our priority. It's okay to start shifting it now, start moving things around, making him number one. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord, that reigns in our lives. Father, thank you that we get to be in your presence, that we get to serve you, that we get to sit in your throne room. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you move upon our hearts to come and have relationship and fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord, this morning that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords and the master of our life. Father, as we go on through this week, let us take this and just analyze of all things we've said today, analyze the fact that we need to put you first. Show us even in every step that we make, everything that we do this week, where we're not putting you first. And just give us clear direction. And I know when you do, it's going to move us into a better place. We're going to smile bigger. Our pockets are going to be bigger. Our lives are going to be longer. Everything is going to be better because we made you Lord. Show us that this week, Father. We love you. We glorify you. Lord, we pray for the ones who are not here today that are sick. There's so many out today sick. And we thank you, God, that you're moving in their lives today. You're touching them. We glorify you for that, Lord. Anyone here that's not feeling well, we thank you, Jesus, that you're touching them right now. Thank you, Lord, that you're touching them right now. All pain is leaving right now in Jesus' name by the authority of heaven. All pain is leaving. All negative thoughts are fading away right now in Jesus' name. We're focusing on you right now. We're glorifying you right now. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. If there's anyone that wants to pray this morning, to reshift, redirect, make him even more of a Lord than had he had, that he has been. Come and pray. Give it to him. Help him rearrange your life to make your life better, to make your life the fullest that he's called it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and pray if you need to.